Hi, welcome everyone. Um, we're just going to give it a minute for everyone to join and filing in. Thank you so much for joining. Um, while we're waiting for people to come in, um, I'm just going to walk you through what is going to happen today. Um, so my name is Sonia. I'm the Education Director at Magnum Photo. Uh, I'm the, also the course coordinator for the Spales, um, Spales course in Paris. And today we're going to basically walk you through the program that is taking place every year, the creative documentary and photojournalism program that is taking place every year in Paris. Um, I'm joined today by Magnum photographer Stuart Franklin and Pierre-Yves Maé, who is the director of the Spiel School. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. We will not use the raise hand function, so all of your questions, please, uh, you can implement them in the Q&A box. Um, if we will start with a, let me show you what is going to happen. So we will start with a presentation by Stuart Franklin, who is one of the main mentor on the course. So Stuart will talk to us about his work, but also give some specific advice to students start thinking of joining the course, um, as he has been following many different cohorts throughout the years. Um, after, so if you want, if you have any questions for Stuart uh, after his talk, we will take them at the end. And again, please use the Q&A function, uh, not the chat function. And once after Stuart's presentation, we will, me and Pierre-Yves will talk more specifically about what is happening um, during the year in Paris between Magnum and spells. And again, you can uh, ask any questions you have about the course. Um, so we're just going to wait for another minute for people to come. Uh, and then we're going to start with Stuart. And it's nice to see people coming from all over the world. I see people in New York, people in Tehran, very nice. So um, Stuart Franklin, so Stuart is joining us today. And let me tell you about him. Um, Stuart Franklin combines a direct documentary style with a strong personal vision. He has photographed some of the most important news events of the 20th century, as well as produced many acclaimed personal projects, exploring subjects relating to the Anthropocene. Stuart says his practice repaints the boundaries of documentary in order to create a sense of freedom. His core interest today is in producing work, mostly about nature society relations that is open to multiple interpretations. It was in 1989 that Stuart took his acclaimed photographs in Beijing's Tiananmen Square, where a demonstration for freedom ended in a massacre. After that, he began to move away from news into magazine feature photography. Between 1990 and 2008, he photographed about 20 stories for National Geographic magazine. During this time, Stuart decided to pursue a better theoretical understanding of some of the issues he confronted by embarking on a period of academic study in 1995. He graduated with a first class degree in geography from Oxford University and went on to complete his doctoral thesis there in 2001. He was awarded a, a professorship in documentary photography in 2016. He has been published by numerous global public publications, including The Guardian, Sunday Times Magazine, 
Geo Art Magazine Harper's Bazaar National Geographic Magazine. Between 2009 and 2013, Straight Focus on a Long-Term Landscape Project in Norway, published as Narcissus in 2013. The documentary on Impulse was published by Feridun in April 2016. It investigates the nature of truth in reporting and the drive towards self-representation beginning 515,000 years ago with cave art through to the various iterations and impulses that have guided documentary photography along its different tracks for nearly 200 years. Stuart John Magnon Photo in 1985 and has been a full member since 1989. And he was the agency elected president between 2006 and 2009. Thank you, Stuart, for being with us today. I'm gonna to stop sharing my screen and let you share yours. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes. Very good. Well, before I share my screen, um, and since we are talking about France a little bit, since Spales has its main teaching unit in France, there was a writer called Anatole France. Anyone remember him? He said 90% of education is encouragement. And basically, that is what I'm about when it comes to mentoring and when it comes to education, supporting, encouraging, and being positive about work and trying to lift up and get the best out of, of everybody. So that's my sort of starter. What I have to continue, the main course, if you like, because I only have 20 minutes, is um, to show you a few photographs to talk briefly about them and then to field any questions that you may have. How does that sound? So what I'm gonna do now is share my screen and talk a little bit about a few pictures. So, um, can you all see that? Just a sort of thumbs up situation. Um, so yes, as, as um, Sonia rightly says, I have been teaching for quite a while uh, at, at um, Speos and I've loved it. I think we've had very enthusiastic, um, very successful students come through um, with the support of Pierre-Yves who's here on the call. And, you know, what I think it's mainly about is, is sort of showing work um, together, uh, looking at what, what you do sort of based on a project that we will set. Um, and a lot of that has to do with preparing in advance of starting the course, you know, thinking, okay, I'm going to come and join this course. What do I need? You need cameras, you need an idea or some ideas. And as Sonia said, right at the beginning, the course is about creative documentary and photojournalism. And, you know, documentary is, as it's been described, the creative treatment of actuality. And it is, creative has to come from two sources. It comes from inside you, and it comes from the world around you. And what we do on this course is try to get you to connect those two worlds, the world inside you and the world outside, and to produce something uh, that is meaningful in terms of a series of photographs that you will be proud of. So I'm going to just talk about a few photographs now. Um, this is one that I'm reasonably well known for having taken. It was taken in 1986 in uh, Manchester, and it was assigned on an assignment for Newsweek magazine. And it was really talking about during, if you like, Margaret Thatcher's Britain of unemployment. And I spent a lot of time, there are no shortcuts in documentary, walking around these uh, poorer parts of Manchester. And what I think I've tried to do with this picture is to sort of use the whole picture space to tell a story about growing up in that particular place. This is a picture I took in an army 
exercise in England, it still haunts me to this day. It was taken around the same time uh, of an anti-nuclear chemical and biological warfare exercise. And it has a kind of mystique through the reflections um, that and, and kind of smokiness that I think works well. Uh, this is probably the picture I'm best known for. It was taken in, uh, as Sonia said, in uh, uh, June 1989 um, in um, Beijing in China, uh, as this uh, gentleman stood in front and sought to stop a row of tanks moving out from uh, Tiananmen Square. I had, of course, done an awful lot of other work uh, at that time uh, in Beijing. And... Um, you know, Tiananmen Square was sort of the epicenter of what began in April 89 uh, after the death of Hu Yaobang as a, uh, as, a pro as a grievance movement, as a protest movement that, that grew up and became um, something else, really, a democracy movement. Uh, and it was savagely cracked down uh, on the days between the 2nd and 4th of June um, 89, as you all know. Um, this was also shot in China a few years later um, in Shanghai. And one of the things I've often tried to do is sort of shine a light on environmental issues uh, wherever I've gone. And this is a coal works. Um, most of the cooking when I was in Shanghai uh, was done um, using coal gas. Uh, and if you walk or, or you run down the street as I used to, you can fill your lungs with uh, this, uh, this dust uh, across the whole city. It's of course much cleaner now. Um, as Sonia said, this is, um, uh, I worked quite a lot in Norway and this is the cover picture from, um, uh, from my book, Narcissus. And one of the things that sort of struck me as I was working on both this book and the next one I'll talk about is the notion that we see the world through what's been described as the spectacles of memory. We see the world through the spectacles uh, of memory. And so every time we look out at something, it triggers a memory. Uh, it might be a memory of a form, of a human form or of an idea. And I think it's that triggering that is part of, if you like, the internal search uh, in photography that connects, as I said earlier, with the external search uh, into the world uh, outside. Uh, and so this image is just literally ice, um, uh, what they call in Norway, bar frost um, on, a, uh, on a piece of soil. But it struck me as an interesting image. Um, and I oscillate between the work um, of landscape photography and also photojournalism. So this uh, photograph taken in a London hospital right at the start of the COVID um, pandemic in uh, April 2020 uh, became the cover of the Sunday Times magazine. Um, and I also wrote the article. So um, I spent three weeks in this hospital documenting um, COVID, probably the worst time, certainly the worst time we've had it uh, in Britain. Um, um, so it, it was a tough story, but I think having the support of the magazine and being able to write the text as well um, was extremely helpful in sort of sending out the message of what it was actually like um, being there. And that's the point of documentary and photojournalism is that you are, if you like, a witness to the times. Um, and that's what um, I felt I was. And this was at a time when no one had been able to get into the hospitals or photograph them, by the way, uh, in Britain. Um, so this is a patient struggling with a CPAP mask uh, in one of the uh, wards in, um, in the hospital where I worked uh, in London. And then this is some of the work that I've done uh, in my last book that I published, Analogies, uh, shot all over the place. This, this particular picture was shot in Southern Egypt. And I'm just sort of fascinated by things that I find and the ideas or ambiguousness that, that, that 
that attaches themselves to some of these images. Uh, in fact, one of the books I wrote recently was on ambiguity, which interests me uh, a lot. Um, this was photographed in uh, Morocco uh, on the same project. And both of these were funded by Leica um, and became an exhibition at the Leica Gallery uh, before the pandemic. Um, and this was photographed in Morocco. Um, this was photographed in Norway uh, and all became part of this book, um, Analogies. Uh, this was photographed in Italy, uh, actually in Sicily. Uh, so you can see it's, uh, it's quite a diverse uh, project. Um, and these pictures were photographed uh, 10 days ago uh, on the border of uh, Moldova uh, Romania and Ukraine, and they are some of the photographs I took of uh, refugees who have fled from war in uh, Ukraine and the suffering they endured, uh, not only in leaving their homes and their family and everything they knew, uh, but also in the shocking cold um, driven by a fierce uh, northeasterly gale. Um, and so they're sheltering uh, at the border here. Uh, this, this is at the Romanian border. This lady uh, is actually a pro handball player and she's um, one of the lucky ones in that she was able to reunite with her husband uh, at the uh, Romanian border at Segetu Marmetii. And um, the reason her husband was able to get out of um, Ukraine is that he's a Kyrgyzstani national uh, and therefore didn't have to stay to fight. Um, this is a, a picture that uh, I find still quite endearing. It's uh, uh, the 1st of March in Romania um, is a kind of special day when, um, first of all, it's the first day of spring, but secondly, it's the day when people give flowers to other members of the family, to loved ones and so on. And on this particular day, this young girl, uh, six-year-old girl, Antonia was giving tulips out to all the refugees who crossed the border. It was very moving to see, and some of them were sort of welling up as they walked through the border and, and so she'd go up and give them a hug and then they carried on through. These were some of the sort of really touching moments that I witnessed uh, on these borders, some of which were pretty bleak and austere. This is through the snow uh, in the night crossing um, one of the um, uh, Romanian border points um, at Segut. Um, and, you know, people that, uh, families who didn't have anywhere to go who crossed the border here in Moldova uh, were invited to stay in tents. Now, um, many people didn't want that because they, you know, first of all, there's nowhere to wash, there's nowhere to organize any food or anything, you know, bathrooms. And also they imagined it would be freezing, but actually that pipe uh, in the back is pumping hot air into the tent, but it's still absolutely dismal for these people. And this is actually two families living in one tent uh, on the border. Um, one of the things that I hope you'll learn if you come to Speos is um, the importance of lighting. I very rarely light photographs, in fact, in the field. But if you go into a blue tent, uh, you're going to meet a very obvious problem uh, that everything inside the tent is gonna be blue, tinted because of the color of the tent. Uh, luckily, I had um, a strobe with a wireless transmitter and an assistant who could hold a light uh, away from me uh, and light uh, the family in the tent, without which this picture would have no value uh, and no meaning. So one of the things that we will teach uh, in uh, Speos is when to use lighting and when not and how to use it. Uh, and I just threw that in as an example. Uh, this is also lit, in fact, uh, and this is a family who've come from Kiev. Uh, they're in a hostel in Moldova and they've traveled with their blind uh, 90, well, Svetlana, the lady's blind 90 year old mother, all the way from Kiev on buses. 
um, and the struggles they've had to get there uh, were just remarkable, awful. Um, and this is again people crossing uh, the borders um, uh, here in uh, Moldova. Um, and, you know, having crossed the border, it's no easy matter to get, in this case, to Bucharest or Chisinau. Uh, and they were sort of triaged into two queues. Uh, and, and this was the queue to Bucharest. People trying to go to Bucharest being sort of turned away from vans in the freezing cold. Um, this is on the other side of the border, on the Ukrainian side. Uh, and these are people queuing to come to the Ukrainian checkpoint uh, at the border. And the queue stretches on for miles and miles. The, car, the queue of cars, I think, was 23 kilometers long on the day that I was there. Um, this is on a ferry on the Danube River. So this is on the Ukrainian side of the border. The border runs down the middle of the Danube. And this is a Ukrainian soldier helping uh, mothers with their children um, to board the boat, you know, when they've got all their luggage and children to carry uh, and so on and so forth. And this is um, coming back uh, to um, Romania um, on the ferry, again, crossing the Danube uh, from uh, Romania. So that's what I wanted to show you. Uh, I know it's brief, it's brief for a reason. It's brief because we don't have a lot of time um, for my presentations and more important than my presentations are your questions and seeing if I can help and answer them uh, in a meaningful sort of way. So I hope that was helpful. Thank you, Stuart. Um, there are actually a lot of questions by now. <laughs> so just so for um, to to add to what Stuart said at the very beginning of his presentation, the the role of the mentors on on the course. Um, there is a Magnum teaching side of the course, and then there is a Spios teaching side of the course. And on the Magnum teaching side, what we ask students is to produce a personal project, which is then at the end of the course being exhibited at the Magnum Gallery in Paris. And Stuart is going to be one, is already, and is going to be next year as well, um, one of the mentor, as in the person you're going to see the most throughout the year and is going to follow you through your journey of creating this personal project. Um, so in terms of like questions for you, Stuart, let me read through. So someone is asking, you mentioned that creativity comes from two sources, from inside and from the world around you. Could you tell us a bit more about some of your creative inspirations and the influences on your work? Mm, um, <laughs> I, I, it's, it's difficult to be uh, specific, but I think, you know, part of creativity is feeling things about, you know, what people are going through. And so, you know, the, I just showed you some pictures of the work I'd done uh, in Ukraine and on the border of Ukraine and Romania and Moldova. And I think, you know, you've become very sensitive um, to, um, to what people are going through. And it sort of gets inside you, you know, that you want to somehow um, express you know, express what, what it's like. And so you sort of blend your own sense of horror uh, at what's happening with what you can see around you, I suppose. I mean, that's not a great example, but um, in terms of landscape, um, I suppose, you know, I don't really see landscape in, as a traditional sort of notion of a view, but I see images that, or I see things in the landscape that kind of, um, how do you say, uh, that remind me of things. It's a bit like if you smell a wood burning fire or something, it reminds you of a situation that you were in or you smell fish and chips and they remind you of a people that you shared things with. So a memory is a big part of the creative inspiration um, that I have and that, you know, and that's how I kind of remain true to my work. 
which I think you always have to be. You have to be kind of true to your own work. And a lot of that truth comes from my own memory. I think that's really the best way I could sum it up. My Thank own experience. You. Thank you, Stuart. Um, there is a few questions around uh, how do you approach photographing people that are in a distressed situation, such as um, the Ukraine work that you've just shown, and, and how do you navigate the day traumas and the work that you have to do? Um, to it, it's very difficult because clearly people are traumatized and um, uh, are suffering. And I think that um, somehow you have to be very calm. And very often I will talk to people, obviously with translator before I photograph, very often there is a sense of tacit approval because at some of these border points there were, I wasn't the only photographer or only member of the press. So I think, you know, people accepted the fact that there was a kind of press presence when they crossed the border, which made it easier to sort of be accepted as somebody photographing. Um, but I think, you know, it is, I mean, you use the word navigate, Sonia, it, it, it is always a case of navigating um, people's sensitivities and being, you know, if people say no, no pictures, then, 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 you know, I don't stay around and photograph. So I sort of, you know, I, I tend to work on the basis of a kind of tacit approval, but it is really important for me to get close uh, to people. And, uh, and I found it actually extremely easy. And also I found it the case that many people wanted to tell their story uh, and were, were keen to tell their story. For example, the families in the tent, the uh, Svetlana and Sege, the couple who'd come with uh, uh, Nadia, who's the 90 year old woman, they really were keen and people are actually, in my experience, very keen to tell their story. So there's a combination of not simply being there as a photographer, but also being there, if you like, taking down somebody's story. Um, so that is the job of journalism. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's 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 a quite a tough job at times, but I think it's a very rewarding job. And I think it's a very necessary job um, because there is so much, uh, uh, there's a huge public need uh, in a democracy for um, uh, honest uh, journalism. Uh, may I say that? <laughs> yeah, and actually that's going to lead me very nicely to the next question, which is, um, do you think it's easy to offend the national security law if photographing and publishing some political issues in a communist country? How do sorry, say, say that again uh, slowly. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. So do you think it's easy to offend the national security law if photographing and publishing some political issues in a communist country? How does a photographer cope with this issue? So I guess it's right. what do you do with censorship? I think you have to, um, I mean, it's always going to be a struggle, isn't it? I think, you, you know, you either, you have two choices, don't you? You either go along with it and you go, okay, I'm going to sort of self-censor myself and not show this and not show that and not do this and be a good boy or a good girl. Or, you know, you're, you know, perennially um, tapping at the door of opportunity to, uh, to show and to tell what's going on. And you can see that in, in Russia today. You know, there are people that are compliant with what's going on. Uh, in terms of the war, and there are people that, that that are not. And so, you know, you have to decide what kind of person you, <laughs> where, where you fit in, in that um, world. Yes, I know where answer. I fit. <laughs> and maybe, maybe um, one last question, maybe, and it's really about the, the course and, and the impact that it has can have on someone's career. So, um, how, why do you feel it's, whether it's for an amateur photographer or photography enthusiast, how impactful it is, um, this course can be for someone? I think it's really important if you're studying anything, I mean, in the arts, if you're studying, um, you know, music or uh, photography or painting or poetry or writing, that you are, 
uh, alongside other colleagues. You'll find you'll learn as much from your colleagues on the course as you will from the teachers. And it's about getting support from the community of people around you. Not only that, but also the Magnum photographers, the books and so on and so forth. But uh, a lot of people are surprised by how much they learn from the other people, the, their colleagues uh, and the support of their colleagues on the course. And I found this on several different uh, kinds of um, uh, programs. Um, so it, you, in joining a course like this, you join a community of support. Uh, and that community has many different facets. Uh, one of them is your colleagues uh, who will become your friends, I'm sure. Uh, another is the teachers, another is the institution itself, another is the photographers that you'll meet, another is the books, the photographs, the experiences, the exhibitions that you'll see and become exposed to. And all of those will help to shape your sense of who you are and who you want to be in the world of photography. I suppose that's the best way I can put it. Thank you. Yeah, I really agree. Um, it is like this coming all together. So just as a conclusion, there is a very nice comment from Ted who says, if I take this course, will Stuart sign my, co my copy of a documentary in Pauls, a truly inspiring book. <laughs> in your, I agree. Very kind. Um, I will. I, Absolutely. Actually, Here's the, my pen. <laughs> <laughs> we usually start the year with the first two lectures by Stuart are on the documentary in Pauls. Um, and so this is, this is how it starts. And you could get your copy signed for sure. Stuart, Stuart, thank you so much um for joining and for your inspiring words and thoughts and um we can we can let you go now you have to, <laughs> okay. to leave us we will answer some of the other questions directly um typing them and we will continue with the presentation with pierre and myself thank you so much Stuart. thank you so much sonia brilliant as always thank you pierre Eve. brilliant as always really lovely to see you both see you in paris soon mm, see bye -bye. you bye 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 so i'm going to um share my screen again and we will continue so this next part is going to be about me telling you basically um a little bit what happens on the magnum side of the course so um, you, when, you, when you join for the course, you go to the Magnum office um, two days a week. One day is taught by um, Leonardo, who's a teacher at Speos, and then a day is taught by a Magnum photographer, and that's every week. We have just changed offices in Paris, and we now have a very nice gallery space and office uh, in the 11th arrondissement. This was a picture taken this year for the annual meeting with all the some of most of the photographers. Um, the new office also has also a new gallery and this is where you will have your uh, group show at the end of the year. So there is always a um, graduate show that is taking place at the Magnum Gallery. And, and now we have this really beautiful space that I just opened not even a year ago where we can host the exhibition. Um, the great thing with the new location is that we are neighbors with the with Speos, so you're about five minutes walk away, which um, is also very convenient things because you have many more facilities at Speos than you have at Magnum. Joining the course also gives you access to all of our on-demand courses, which so far we have six. So. The Art of Street Photography, which is a compilation of um, with several Magnum photographers, and then individual courses with Pika de Porter, Alexos, Jonas Bendixson, Matt Black, and the last one is Gregory Halpern. Um, so as you've seen for us, um, when, when you join the course, we really focus on helping you work on your personal project, which will then be exhibited at the gallery. And for this, we work with um, we, we work with Mantas Stewart being one of them, and then Nana Hartman and Jerome Cecini, and they really are there with you throughout the year to follow basically your journey into making this body of work. Uh, and then on top of that, you have every week new photographers visiting. Um, this year so far, there's been Susan Meslas, 
Sabia Chimen, Matt Black, Antoine Dagata, Richard Calva, Thomas Dvorak, et cetera, et cetera. So there is like someone, a, a new, another Magnum photographer coming in every week. Um, so this is for the Magnum uh, side of the course. And we're going to now show you um, a little video for Spears and I'm going to leave the Pierre to explain. Hello. Now you will have to deal with a very good French accent. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we will show you a quick video of um, Speos to show you the facilities. Um, until now, we spoke about the dream uh, side with Magnum. We are the boring side with technique. We impose uh, to everybody going through Speos to have a very, very strong technique. Uh, whatever the level of the people initially when they arrive, we start from zero very quickly and bring everybody at a pretty high level uh, after. We'll teach you all the very strong basics of photography, uh, studio uh, for photojournalism, because you need to be able to use uh, light, as said Stuart a few minutes ago, when you are photojournalist, you sometimes you have to take portraits uh, with no light, and uh, so you need to be able to deal with that. We teach you everything about image management, printing techniques, uh, the basics of storytelling, of course, and a bit of video for photographers too. Um, so um, we teach um, with a lot of practice. There is no theory at Spios. We just shoot, 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 and shoot. Um, and you leave the space when the photo is good. Uh, of course, we send you on many different events in photojournalism too. We teach you uh, all the, the first exercise of photojournalism. After the art direction is given to Magnum, but the basics, uh, we teach them uh, and we train you. This is the equipment on the screen that we provide out of the school. Um, the school is open 12 hours a day. You can permanently use the facilities. As she said, um, Sonia, we are right near uh, Magnum, which is really great. And uh, of course, all the screens are calibrated. Um, uh, the equipment is brand new and uh, you learn in the best situation in very small groups. So you see the classrooms, it's not big, big ones. And uh, we even have a a lab, but it is not very much often. It's more to show the invention of photography because we own the house where the first photo of the world was made in Burgundy, Nisephor Niep's house. It's a museum. So we teach those techniques uh, once a year. We explain what we do. We have our own method, the stop system. Uh, in general, yes, we simplify a lot the technique. We teach the uh, biggest um, equipment, but in a very, very simple way. In a few days, we teach you how to use perfectly four by five cameras, how to control the light. Uh, this is really our specialization, make things simple. The philosophy is to say that uh, Schumacher didn't calculate the curves, but he, he, he dropped very fast. And if those who did calculate it for him took the same car behind him, they would not succeed at the end. So it's really different. Um, you need to know the technique on one side. And uh, after you, when you have the technique, when you're in control of the technique, you can express yourself uh, perfectly. Here you are in the, one of the main rooms of Spheres where we can meet all together. Um, it's uh, an open space of 400 square meters where we can build studios, make lectures. Um, voilà. So the school is very spacey compared to the amount of people we have. Those studios were made between uh, during COVID uh, two years ago because we we stopped two months in France, so we were closed, but we opened two months more to finish the program and we multiplied by two the amount of studios to be sure that everybody would be taught the same way. So this is the end of the video and maybe of what I have to say, but I'm uh, okay to answer to any question. Thank you, Pierre. If there are lots of questions, actually, I'm taking notes. Um, so I think the one that comes back uh, is 
then once after taking the course, how do you uh, build a career in photography? And I think you can maybe talk about the Spios network and how this is. Yes, of, of course, of course, Spios has a big network, but we, um, which allows us to invite a lot of guests. So if you go in the website um, and you see the lectures uh, um, part in uh, the alumni section or in the, um, in the school section, you'll find uh, all the lectures with uh, teachers. So um, we have approximately 100 uh, lectures um, per year. Uh, for this program, uh, including uh, people which are pretty difficult to have normally, like uh, Jean-François Leroy, Visa pour l'image, uh, François Ebel, uh, formerly uh, Arles. Uh, but we have uh, Salgado, we have, uh, you can see the list, it is uh, amazing, and every year, uh, new people of the same level. So it's a very good way to meet people and live with. Um, pretty interesting address book and a very good overview of the market. And our teachers do uh, teach only a few hours per, per week and never teach in another school. They go back in the professional activity, which is even good for our own marketing. So they are really from the field. Uh, so it's a very, very, um, when you leave the school, you really know where to go. And we even have a part where we teach how to make a business plan, all the right stories. So it's very complete. It's really, as an, um, uh, we teach you to become a photographer, but an entrepreneur too. Yeah, and I think this is really important. So the, the end of the year is really, there are this, this time which is really dedicated to um, introduce you to photo editors, people that might commission you afterwards. There's a question about are the students sent on photo assignments for publications in Paris? The question is it's not for publications, but there is a time for uh, a, quite a good number of photo editors to come and see the work of the students at the school. And this is also how um, we make the connections. There is, so for the, for the course, um, part of the first year, uh, the first semester is that every week you will have to, Leonardo, who is the, the Spios professor, gives uh, weekly assignments that are often really linked to a news events and things like this. And then, so you, you discuss the assignment in class do the assignment and then come back the following week with the result of your work and you show this for group crits. Um, so this, this, is, um, this is one of the things that is being taught. Uh, there is, so the this, this start of the year is going to be September, 2022. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> Um, and there is questions of like, um, question about uh, what do we look for the, in the application and what is a successful portfolio? And also another question that comes back is how many pictures do you have in a, in a photo essay? I can leave this to you, Pierre, if maybe. Well, um, so so the, the applications we have, uh plenty of criteria to select people, but we ask you uh, approximately 20 photos, but I would say even bad because we are supposed to teach you photography. <laughs> Um, so we like to, uh, to see your history. A few people come uh, to change the job as they are doing something else and they want to come in photography. Some, are, some others are coming uh, brand new photographers. So we have many different profiles um, in those programs. Um, so um, just send your photos and your history and your motivation to come and see us and uh, we will answer very quickly uh, if uh, you are you have the profile of the program or not and we have an individual meeting by video conference and it's a very actually there is a so um the, we give you the accommodations is not um you, you will have to find your own accommodation in Paris. Spios is helping you when it comes to visa. Can you also, there's a question about language tests. Pierre, if you, can you tell a bit about the French classes? If... Uh, it's it's uh, every program in Spios is made both in French or in English. If you take English, it's 100% in English. If you take in French, it's 100% in French, except the lectures, which are all in English. 
The school historically, which is uh, 37 years old, uh, spoke English mainly until six years ago. We started to speak a little bit in French, uh, but it's mainly English with uh, optionally a French accent. So this is, and there is like, when, if people need to apply for a visa, um... Uh, we, uh, as soon as we have the application and we accept people, we send all the documents to get the visa. Uh, for the housing, we help a lot. Uh, we don't find the apartment for people, but we uh, give them different uh, directions, uh, agencies uh, which uh, used to work with us. We have some apartments already which come, uh, come back every year because the owners like to give uh, them to uh, spare students. So we really help people to uh, arrive in uh, in France. Um, there is a question about ethics in photography that I can also answer this part. So how much of the course is focused on ethics in journalism? Um, and so we, on the Magnum side of the course, this is something that we look at through the various photographers that are coming in. And there is also two dedicated days um, that are just for this. One of them is actually tomorrow, um, where we, where we have uh, we create space for workshop and bring experts um, yeah. one of them tomorrow is Jess Crombie who's experts in in has written reports on the ethics of journalism and, and issues of representation in photography and so this is something that is very much discussed um, also because whenever you work on your personal project for the you might have or decide to work on a topic that is quite sensitive um, and we want to make sure that uh, both for you and the people you design to photograph, it's made um, in ways that it, it's going to not harm anyone. Um, one, so let me go through the questions. One that come back is about career change. So it's maybe good to, to say that some people have joined, they had never done photography before and really wanted to make a move and, and become professional photographers. Um, some have um, stopped, were photographers a long time ago and then uh, had to take a break and then wanted to come back to it and, and then come to do the course. So the, the experiences and the, and, and, and the profiles of people deciding to join are very varied. And I think this, for me, what makes the strengths of the group as well. Like Stuart says, um, at the end, it's a group. And there's a question about how many people join on it. Um, minimum of 12. And we, don't, we wouldn't have like a huge group. But at the end, you're all friends, no? So it's also this, this building this network of people coming from from all over the world this year, it's people from Spain, from the US, um, from France, from, from Cambodia, from India, and, um, and the age range, uh, I think this year is from 18 to 50 something maybe. So it's, it's uh, again, for me, it's the strength of this group is the diversity of the group every time. You have, uh, by the way, a Google map on uh, Spiros website, which shows where are the alumni. So it's a way to see what they do today after the school and of eventually to be in touch with them, knowing that they answer the three first years generally, and after they don't answer anymore. But uh, you can see what they do on this Google map. It is in the alumni section of the website of Spiros. And uh, just so in terms of like, we are taking applications now, um, if you have any questions, you can know, know in terms of how we divide the information and um, everything that is relating to Spios will be answered by Spios and everything that is related to Magnum will be answered by me. Um, and we obviously speak to each other often. So, um, and so I'm going to put in the chat two email addresses, one that is if you wish to contact Spios and you can contact them for questions and the other one is, is my address. Um, and I see now a question about, is there class every day? Yes, so I think this is something that for me is really important is if, 
And maybe this also answers the question of why, why joining if you want to make a career change is I think joining for this one year forces you to really work hard and completely immerse yourself both in Paris and in your photography work. Um, and I think this is really important that you know that you can commit and it's going to be a really intensive year, which is why you can make also that much progress in, in this period of time. Um, so there, there is class every day. And some people stay 12 hours a day in the school. You have to know, except when you have to shoot, you have to go outside. Uh, there. Actually, it's not specifically in Speos or Magnum, so you have to be uh, very much outside too to shoot. But it has very, very intensive programs. Yeah. Uh, there are questions, Pierre, as well about taking if people are unable to travel to Paris about doing the class virtually. So for the Magnum Speos partnership, it's not possible. We expect people, students, to come to Paris. No, for, for two years we are doing. Uh, we have the system installed all in all the classrooms. Of course, when we had people with COVID, they stayed at home and we did um, uh, put the video on. But now we stopped because photography, you don't learn. You learn it by practice. You need to be there. So it was just a temporary period to help during COVID, but we don't uh, want to keep the video system. It's very disturbing even for teachers to uh, to have two population, one in front of them and the other they don't see. It's uh, very um, complicated. So we don't think we will uh, uh, develop that or keep it. And um... Regarding the personal project, there is a question about whether it has to be in Paris. Actually, no, it doesn't. Um, so this year, so it's um, this is a bit of a minefield of a question because we, the way we 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 support students in making this long term pro or personal project is is whether by trying to make them do something that is realistic within the requirement of the course and the fact that they are studying in Paris, etc. And at the same time, giving you the personal freedom to do really what inspires you. No? Um, so for example, this year, most of the projects are in Paris, but some of them, uh, there's a student who is doing something in Mumbai, which is his hometown. So he took time over the Christmas and, and, and February holidays to work on this. And it had, was something that I had started before doing the course. Uh, same for another student in Texas. So it's, and then there's also work that is done in the countryside uh, outside of Paris. So it's, um, and regarding the fine art prints, um, this, this is something that is being talk, talked about at the, at the, during the year. I'm correct, Pierre, if no, learning about galleries and the fine art market. Well, yes, 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 we, uh, we, we bring you in some places and tell you what you have to. To go and see. Um, and there's another question of like by every day does it include weekends? Well, <laughs> you might have to take pictures during the weekend. Yes, yeah, so a lot of things happen during the weekends. In France, we are very good at strikes as they are during the weekends. Uh, but yes, so you have uh, generally uh, pretty many things to do. It's quite seven days a week. Yes, it's uh, it's true. You have to think this way. Maybe Pierre, do you want to say something to to close this session? Something of like some words of wisdom, um, final <laughs> final advice. <laughs> no, it's a it's a program we like very much. Mm -hmm. I personally personally work with Magnum for more than thirty years um, on different aspects, and we are very close to each other. Um, there is a very good ambience in both um, places, and they, so it's, it's a very nice program and nice group. So we love this program, and we hope it will continue for years. And if you can be with us next year, we will be very happy to know you soon. Thank you very much. Um, so you will receive the follow-up email from us after this session, and any additional questions you have feel free to contact us, uh, questions we haven't answered during this chat. Um, and a, a reminder that um, the applications are open. It will start at the beginning of September. And do look out for the 
in May, we will have the graduate show at the Magnum Gallery, and there will be um, Instagram Live on Magnum Learn, where you can see the students um, taking you through the exhibition and so some of a few things coming up with this year's student that are going to be really nice. So it also gives you some idea of what they've worked on and, um, and what they've achieved during this year together. And same thing on the Spears website, because you have two uh, exhibitions, one in Magnum, but just after a very big one too in, uh, in uh, Spears, the old school becomes a huge gallery. And so you can see the videos of the last years uh, online, uh, but of course this year too will be online. So it's a way to meet the students, to see them uh, in front of their portfolio. And uh, so it's, uh, it would be a very good way to understand what happened uh, in the school. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, thank you, Pierre-Yves. Thank you, too. And thank you, everybody, for Have... being so patient. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>